Hey, what's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 271, and we're going to cover Zechariah. Today, we'll cover chapters 1 through 7, and tomorrow, we'll cover chapters 8 through 14. So if we're looking at these prophets, I guess it's really good for us to link this prophet with Haggai, because during the time that the temple was being rebuilt, there are two things that happens. Haggai focuses on the present, on the actual temple being rebuilt, and Zechariah focuses on the future, which is why we get a book of messianic prophecy. In fact, there is no other book that I can think of other than Isaiah that gives more messianic prophecy than Zechariah. There are a lot of prophecies in this book. But we'll try to focus on some of the most prominent ones as we walk through this book together. Now, the major task of both Haggai and Zechariah was to exhort the Jewish people to rebuild a temple. You see, Haggai comes along and he preaches that, hey, we need to rebuild a temple. They started building the temple, then they stopped in two years when they started receiving those objections, which was coming from the Sumerians. Then Haggai comes along and says, you're neglecting the Lord's work. You haven't worked on the temple in 14 years. So basically for 14 years, they were preoccupied with their own interests. And that's what we covered in Haggai. He was like, look, you all don't have a building problem. Because look at your houses, they're nice, they have panels. You have a selfishness problem. You've allowed opposition, fear, discouragement, and believing that this work is insignificant because the temple is smaller than the one before to cause you to stop. And so Haggai's preaching is actually successful. Actually, both Haggai and Zechariah were successful. They were successful prophets because the people listened to the word. They listened to their preaching and what they recommended the people did. And this shows us the importance of the ministry of the word of God produces this. So the finishing of the temple was tied to the ministry of the word, which shows us what the ministry of the word produces. So in 536, the building of the temple started in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Then right after two years, it stops. It's 534. You get these objections by the Sumerians, and they abandon the work after two years. And then there's a 14-year gap. Then comes the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. And so after 14 years in 520, the work picks back up again. And then four years later, they finish. And as we say it, Haggai did his encouragement by focusing on the present, the rebuilding. But Zechariah does his encouragement by focusing on the future, the Messiah. So he's saying, look, I want you to lift your eyes off of the present and focus on the future. And he does this by giving a series of visions. So he has eight night visions. He has eight visions in one night. And then he has two burdens, two prophetic messages. So the eight visions in chapters one through six, you're gonna see a horseman among the myrtle trees, which is in chapter one, verses seven through 17. The second vision is the four horns and the four craftsmen. That's verses eight through 21. You'll see a man with a measuring line in chapter two, clean garments for the high priest in chapter three, a gold lampstand and the two olive trees in chapter four, a flying scroll in chapter five, a woman in a basket in the rest of chapter five and four chariots in chapter six. So I won't be able to look at both the visions and the prophecies because the prophecies are embedded in the visions. And I just thought the prophecies would be more helpful for us because I felt like if I could name the visions and what's happening in the outline, you can pull those things out yourself. Well, what's so beautiful about the book of Zechariah, it's written about 520 to 480, and we get prophecies that come to pass some 500 years later. Let's look at a few before we close out. So the first prophecy we get is in chapter 3, verse 8. The book starts off with, In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. And so that's interesting. Every prophet before we've had a Jewish king, and now we finally get a Gentile king. What's the difference there? We're getting close to the Messiah. Because remember, when the Messiah comes, he comes during the age of the Gentiles, when, when Gentiles are ruling. And so Zechariah even sets the stage for that. But let's look at some prophecies here in chapter 3, verse 8. It says, listen, high priest Joshua, it says, I'm going to bring you my servant, the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua? Here's a prophecy that a servant is coming. Remember Isaiah, the suffering servant? This servant is coming and he'll be a branch. And it says this in chapter 6, verse 12 as well. Behold, a man whose name is branch. He will branch out and build a temple. The Hebrew word for branch is netzer. How is this prophecy fulfilled? The Hebrew word for branch is netzer. Let's bring that into the New Testament. Jesus was called a 
Nazarene, or how will we pronounce it? Nazarene. Jesus fulfills this prophecy. He's from Branch Town. Jesus is the branch. This is why he's called Jesus of Nazareth. If you didn't think that name and being from that place was significant, it's very significant. Please remember, it fulfills the prophecy of chapter 3, verse 8, and chapter 6, verse 12. It also says that he'll be a servant. We'll look at Mark 10, 45. It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And when you see verses like that, you should say in your head, oh, wow, the servant is here. He, Isaiah is being fulfilled. Zechariah is being fulfilled. This is our God. And so Jesus is fulfilling so much prophecy when he's on the scene. Like he'll say stuff like, if you would have known what today meant, today was the day of your visitation and you missed it. He's pointing to something when he does that. So as we close out, remember that our chapters one through six give the eight night visions and it'll be followed by four messages and concluded by two burdens. And you even get in one of those night visions, the story of Joshua, the high priest, which is a representation of Israel. I'm reading verse one. It says the Lord is Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. This is the position you stand at when you're accusing someone and Satan knows that well. He says, the Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. It is not man a burning stick snatched from the fire. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes and he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and have put a fine garment on you. And this is the doctrine of justification right here in Zechariah as well. See, justification does not mean I'm going to treat you as if you never sinned. This is not God taking filthy men and women and making them innocent. That's not the right thinking here. And some people use this play on words. Justification means God treats, God treats you just as if you never sinned. No, that's not the case. What God is doing here is he's not making you innocent, he's making you righteous. He's taking filthy men and women and turning them into righteous men and women. And we find that right here as one of the visions embedded in Zechariah chapter three. So I don't want you to miss out as you're reading through this, through the visions, but, to, but on tomorrow, I'm gonna to spend more time on some of the prophecies and I think they'll blow your mind. Judas is predicted here. How much money Jesus will be betrayed for is predicted here. Think about that now. Oh, 500 years before it happens. And God is so good. And don't let anybody let you doubt your faith or whether you believe in the true biblical God. I'll demonstrate here from Zechariah, 500 years before it happens, prophecies of Christ that come to pass when he gets here. And you know God is capable of it. He predicted Cyrus will come 150 years before it happens. And he even predicts Christ will come 700 years before it happens. See, one thing you can't get around in the Bible is the supernatural activity and nature of it. And that's what a lot of people try to get out of the Bible. But it's very hard because it's all over the place. Because God wrote this word to produce faith in your life. And I hope you have it. Not just a faith that yells and is loud, but a faith that endures to the end. You guys take care and have a good day.